Okay. Morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being so kind. Hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to share a little safety video this morning. I'm going to make it a safety video. You know, we're in the course of finishing up now with the underground section. And um, we looked at a crazy video the other day where they were breaking all kinds of safety rules. Got another little video I want to show here that's um, um, it's, it's more about um, troubleshooting and fault indicators. It's about a three and a half minute video. So a uh, big difference between the other video and this video. So I'm going to share my screen. Share my screen. One, let me share my, oh, wait, here we go. Screen two. Share. Share computer sound. You got it? Yeah. Got it. All right. Let me see if the sound will come up. Earlier, we looked at how a typical URD system is laid out. And we started looking at ways to identify and isolate problems that commonly affect URD systems. We focused on transformer faults in the previous segment. Now we're ready to turn our attention to cable faults. For the remainder of this program, we'll look at different ways to troubleshoot cable faults in a URD system. While the methods we'll focus on are commonly used at many utilities, they may not be exactly like the methods you use. So make sure you're familiar with the procedures used by your company. We'll start our discussion basically where we left off in the previous segment. You'll recall that something caused the fuse on one of the riser poles in the URD system to blow. A troubleshooter visually inspected the transformers on the loop, but couldn't find any visual evidence of a transformer fault. He didn't key. receive any additional information about what key. might be causing the problem from any of the customers on the loop either. With these considerations in mind, the troubleshooter suspects that the blown fuse on the riser pole was caused by a cable fault somewhere between the riser pole and the normally open point. The next step is to locate and isolate the section of cable where the fault is. The way to go about isolating a cable fault in a URD system often depends on the type of equipment in the system. For example, some utilities have devices known as fault indicators installed on the cables in a URD system. Fault indicators can make identifying a cable fault considerably easier. There are several types of cable fault indicators commonly used in URD systems. The type in this system consists of a relay and flag arrangement located within the transformer cover. With this type of indicator, the troubleshooter opens the transformer cover to see if the flag has tripped. A tripped flag indicates that a fault has occurred. Other types of fault indicators use a warning light or an audible alarm to indicate when a fault has occurred. But regardless of the type of indicator used, the basic function of all fault indicators is the same, to make it easier to identify a cable fault. Keep in mind, though, that even when a fault indicator is used, you still need to verify that the cable is faulty. Once a cable fault has been identified, the section of cable that's affected needs to be isolated so that power can be restored to the rest of the URD loop. One way to isolate a faulted cable is by lifting the load brake elbows on the ends of the cable from the feed through bushings on the transformer and placing the elbows in standoffs on the transformers. When you do this, be sure to clearly mark both ends of the faulted cable with warning tags. The warning tags will alert anyone performing switching operations, and they'll help prevent the cables from being accidentally closed in. The tags will also make it easier for the repair crew to identify the isolated ends of the faulted cable. Okay. Um, what I want to touch on first thing here, is, guys, is the gentleman that's doing the work here, I mean, he, he's he got on all his PPs correct. He even, even has on the sleeves, rubber gloves, hard hats, safety glasses. Um, I don't think this is the correct hard hat that a lineman's going to wear. You're going to have the one with the full brim um, that's rated for um, an arc. But anyways, he's he's got his PP on. He's doing his thing. And Just we talk. Right there. 
Hold it right there before you leave. Keep... Yep. Anything more you want to say there? No, go ahead. All right. And uh, when we saw that blown fuse, and you're the first guy out there, or the first couple of guys out there, we typically went to every piece of underground equipment and did a visual inspection inside also. Right. This, this guy just does a walk around. Yeah. So uh, do remember too, I mean, if you're gonna be in a subdivision, you might have 20, 30 transformers in a string. Right. So if you go through and look at every single one, uh, right. I mean, that's a quick inspection because I mean, typically most of your failures as far as the cable is concerned are at the connection points. So that includes the uh, elbow, and where it goes into the transformer. But right. I just want to add, this guy just does, does a walk around. Yeah. Uh, no, we did an inside inspection yeah. also. Correct, correct. And guys, we, we talked about yesterday um, when we were on the single face side, we talked about um, different kinds of fault indicators out there. And you saw the one inside this transformer. Uh, that must be Keaton's older brother right there. I think so. He's got some big old teeth, I know that. Big old sunglasses, too. Yeah. But they got inside, he got inside the transformer, and the, and the guy talked, what this gentleman here, he talked about was um, working it by your company rules. It, you know, pretty much, you know, it's all going to be about the same, but there's, you know, might be a little particular here and there that rule that your company has and goes by, just obey all the company rules that your company goes by when you're doing this. Um, these kinds of fault indicators, when he opened up the lid, looked in it, um, these fault indicators are built into the elbow. I'd never seen this until I looked at this video because we all had the fault indicators that we had to either install on the um, jacket part of the primary cable or in use that he had you know uh, visually open up the transformer physically open it up visually look at it or it might have had a a little light that was installed on the um the door to transformer where if you could ride by at night you'd see the little uh, red light blinking you know there was fault there and you could keep riding that's a very quick way but a lot of those aren't very reliable as well um but you know obey your your rules your company rules, wherever you go to, um, make sure you're doing it their way because I'm sure you break the um, their safety rules and there's consequences for it as well. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit more. With this type of indicator, oh, hang on. Let me go back. located oh. within the transformer. All right, guys, remember yesterday we talked that if it's white, you keep following the fault indicator head um, if it's a fault on that cable or a fault ahead of it down the line, that's going to change over to red. I'm not trying to step on Professor Shoemaker's toes, but I thought that was pretty um, interesting that they had that built into the, um, the elbow itself. And you can see right here that, that he has correct cover up. He's got these spades covered up for the secondary side. Don't need to take any chances getting into, into anything here. Let's see, one more thing. Talk, 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 talk. Lifting the load brake elbows on the ends of the... And you just want to make sure, guys, that whenever you go into these transformers, that you, you he's got his shotgun stick, he's got all his PPE on. And before, just follow the guidelines about, you know, grounding the cable. Um, putting it on standoff, make sure that whenever you grab uh, the primary cable that you take off that you suspect is bad, that you make sure it's got enough primary cable that you can safely take it off and, you know, reinstall it on the, on the standoff as well, because we talked about it yesterday. If it takes two people to do it, if, especially if you're dealing with a hot primary cable on the end of the stick, it might be a little iffy to, um, maneuver that around and it might to take two people, but make sure just like the guy that's, you know, out there now, he's by himself, he's a lone worker, he's operating the stick and he's, if it takes two people, get another person there, put your PP on and he can handle the end of that stick as well. Professor Shoemaker, you got anything you want to add today? No, no, excellent description right there about the second person. Yeah, okay. 
Guys, you got any questions about that, about what we did yesterday, um, safety-wise? Any comments? Sure, different from what you saw the other day. I mean, the guy had everything on, rubber gloves, yeah. all his stuff. Right, yeah, so that's, I would say he's, he's doing it the correct way. Right. Okay. I'm gonna stop share now. Okay. Okay. So with that, and now that we're going to start into fault indicators, you saw pretty much a safety video about that. Well, I'm going to tell you how fault indicators work in the instances that they're used for. So let me get a share screen going. And uh, like Professor V said in the video there, there are different types and styles. Uh, the technology on them is getting much greater. So you should have a share right there. Yes, coming. Is it working? It's still it's coming. Now it's going. Yep. Okay. So uh, and this is in the standards manual that's in the ELW two one one, and this is the type we we mostly used on transformers. Now and I'll have a video here in just a moment of the installation process. This actually mounts on the outside of the transformer. So I don't need to uh, open the transformer up. I can drive by a pad mount transformer. And then this connects around and we'll show you how it connects around the uh, cable assembly inside the transformer. So Professor V video, V's video, what was the color of the flag and what was inside the, the letter? Does anybody remember that one? It was white. It was a white N. White N. Why they use N, I don't know. I'll take N as neutral. Yeah. But it, it, why they use the letter N, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of head scratching on that one, but that, that's used in all of them as far as a white and red indicator and letter. What do I have in, in my share screen right here? Well, fault, right. I've got an F. This flag will be red. All right, so if I've had a fault on the conductor, this flag will be red, but that's the typical ones that we use right there. Now, let me see if I can get this out of the way. Yes. Okay, and I'm gonna bring you up on a, another video. Hopefully, here we go. Can you see that screen? Got it. All right. Talk to you. here to uh, introduce and show you how to use and install the load tracker underground fault and circuit indicator and the navigator overhead fault and circuit indicator. So with the load tracker, uh, to install it, you simply open up the clamp, uh, attach your stick, and you either want to go over above the neutral fold back or directly over top of the neutral fold back either. Okay, so when you, and th this is important as far as the installation is concerned. That's a little bit different style. We started using those load trackers, they're nice. They actually have a fiber optic cable that comes off of them and will flash a light. But he's got a specific area that you need to put it on the elbow at. He says either go above where it's terminated and you see this open area of cable or you go below. Uh, does anybody kind of, and what happens here is this ground comes up inside the cable, then it goes back out and attaches to ground. Is there any specific reason why I can't just put it anywhere? Why do I have to put it over this exposed area? I mean, if it's exposed, then maybe it could electrocute you, huh? No, that's insulated, oh. but there's no ground there. Okay. Why do I not want to put it over the ground and the primary at the same time? Get a false reading. You're going to get a false reading, exactly. Just like we had before when we use an amp meter, this is not an amp meter. Okay, it's not measuring amps. Uh, but the neutral and the ground is going to give the same effect to this fault indicator as you would an amp meter. You're not going to get a correct reading out of it. 
So you have to either put it over the conductor where there is no ground. You see, well, that's why they got that big loop right there. Or you have to put it over where the ground cancels itself out. And I'll draw that out in just a moment to make sure that it indicates correctly. There's fine. Uh, and just simply push it on to that portion of the cable. After installing the product, uh, an optional fiber optic cable can be snapped in and connected to the load tracker. And the fiber optic cable can be remoted to the collar of the manhole or to the exterior of the cabinet. Uh, that way, whenever you detect a fault, whenever the unit is flashing. Okay, so that was really quick right there. Whenever the unit is flashing. Ah, that's me. Exterior of the cabinet. Uh, that way, whenever you detect. What's he holding up to it right there? Anybody got any ideas? Ball indicator. Ball indicator's on the conductor. He drew this thing up from the table and he's holding it against the fault indicator. Any guesses of what that is? Ground. Ground's on the conductor. Magnet. Magnet, there you go. All right, so here we go. We've determined because I just told you that this is not an amp meter. It's not measuring high amps. What does it measure? What does it notice? What's he holding up to the indicator? Magnetic field, I guess. Magnetic field, right. When high current goes through a conductor, it creates a magnetic field, remember? That's in the overhead part. Same thing happens in underground cable. If a high amount of current goes through the conductor and it emits in a magnetic field, that's what the fault indicator is detecting. The fault indicator detects magnetic field from high amperage faults. So actually, he's making his own magnetic field so he can trip the indicator to show you how it works. Detect the fault whenever the unit is flashing. We simply just check the external remote indication from the load tracker. Those things are pretty nice. Like I said, there's different types that are out there in the world. So all I have to do, uh, in, especially at nighttime, is drive up to the front of the transformer where I've got this thing, you know, sticking out of the transformer, mounted to shine on the outside of the transformer and drive by transformers until I stop to see the uh, flashing stop. We'll get to that in just a moment. My other one that I showed you the picture of, that's an actual movement. Okay, there's no lighting in that. So that'll turn from F to N as far as a, to show you a fault or not. Okay, any questions thus far on fault indicators? What do you think their purpose is? When we went out to the field yesterday, how were we defining, how were we finding which cable was faulted? What was our method? It light up red, and that's where you knew where to go where your fault was, right? I had no lights out in the field yesterday. That little thing that V said. That little thing that V said. I which, forgot the name of it. What did you say, V? Fault indicator. All right, we didn't yeah. use fault indicators yesterday. What did we use, What did we do yesterday? Where do we start? What's your first indicator? Fuse. The fuse, okay, that's your first indicator. And we had to start right from the dip pole, correct? Correct. We had to test at the dip pole, then we went to the switch gear. We had to test at the switch gear, then we went to the cabinet. We had to test at the cabinet junction, and then we had to go to the transformer. So we're having to test every single span as we go, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, that was the leapfrog method. We were using uh, high pot adapters and we were leapfrogging every single transformer. Fault indicators on the, on the other hand are great tools. Remember, it's a tool. Doesn't work 100% all the time. So I'm gonna stop this here and start another one in just a moment. We'll move some stuff around. That there. And let's share screen, let's share whiteboard, share. 
Okay, let me know if you see that whiteboard there. Got it. Got it. Move some stuff out of the way. So we'll do this like uh, yesterday, as far as the drawing is concerned, like we had at the three phase dip pole, we're just not gonna use, we're gonna try to make it look single phasey. All right. So we had our uh, dip pole here. Then we went to a switch gear here. Then we went to a three phase enclosure here. Then we went to T1. Then we went to T2. Then we went to the open point three phase enclosure. I know I'm drawing it backwards, but that's the way it looks out there in the field. So switch gear, J J100, T1, T2, and J200. That's how it was out in the field. Here's our overhead line and used for the dip pole. Okay, so when we went out yesterday, what was our first fault indicator? Fuse. Fuse, that's our first fault indicator. And I'm going to use fault indicators this time on this entire sectional line. So I'm just gonna draw like I have in, had in my drawing. I'm gonna draw a little window here. And a little window here. Now, if we're working all three phases, you're gonna have how many windows? Three. I'm just gonna go one just to help you guys out, okay? No indicator in here. That's where it stops. All right, so I'm gonna go fuses balloon. That's my first. This indicator is F red. So it's showing the F and it turned to red. This one's showing F and it's red. Okay, this one is N white. And this one is N white. Which span is the bad span of underground? All the red. Which span? There's only one singular span that's bad. A100. To S. J100 to what? S. Well, to the first. T1, T1 to J100. And so every, everybody's everywhere. All right, think of this process, guys. <laughs> Remember, the indicator has to see a magnetic field from fault current, okay? So if the fault happens here, this indicator is going to see fault current. This indicator is going to see fault current, and the fuse is going to see fault. Fuse is going to uh, see fault current. It's going to blow. All right. So where's my bad span? So from J to the fuse. No. Where's my bad span? T1 to J100. T1 to J100. It's between the red and white span, okay? I'll, I'll back up to just the way I said it before. Fault in the cable here. This fault indicator detected it. This fault indicator detected it. The fuse detected it. This one did not. Nothing, no fault current flew through it. That's on T1. So now I have identified it had, I've got fault current in this span. I've got fault current in this span. I don't have fault current. I've got fault current in this span. I don't have it from here to the point of where it happened at. That's how you do span identification with fault indicators. Simple. Fault is between red and white indicators. That's a simplistic way to put it, okay? 
The fault is between red and white indicators. Now, if we were using flashing lights, what would happen here, like that guy showed in the video, right? I'd have the fuse blown, first indicator. This would be flashing. This would be flashing. This one would, uh, T1 would not be flashing. So I, I would know it's between the non-flashing and flashing indicator. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody understand that? Any questions on this part? Makes sense now. Okay. All right, a really, really good tool. And we'll get more in depth in here in just a moment of uh, a tool you can use a tool that's not to be 100% trusted. It is something out there that's used in the process. Okay, gentlemen, I'm showing uh, 930. 930. Let's take about 10 here, and we're gonna get more in depth of fault indication. We will resume here. Resume. Uh, you should have a whiteboard up, correct? We have a whiteboard up. Okay. So uh, let's reference back here with just a moment. I'm just gonna throw some things up here. So we're gonna just use the red and white. Now we know the fault indicators, we got the red and white flag or we've got a flashing light or anything, but we know the concept and we know the rules. Red, 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 white, 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 white. Okay, and this is dip pole one, this is dip pole two. I've got a blown fuse here. Bang. Where's my faulted span? In between T3 and T4. Between T3 and T4. So yeah, that was just a quick review of uh, what we just discussed in the previous uh, session we had just there. It is very easy, especially when you have subdivisions that have a large amount of transformers to be able to drive by or, or walk by and just look at the outside of the transformer, T1's red, keep going. T2 is red, keep going. T3 is red, keep going. T4, okay, I turn up white. I now know between T3 and T4, that is by faulted span. Now, Professor B in his earlier video today you saw this morning as far as the safety one was concerned, this is dependent on how the company wants you to install them. Our rule is at Safety Cooper was, and I'm gonna draw the internal to the transformer. And this is what they had on the video also. Which cable is the in-bound cable and where does it go? Just like we talked about, on all inbound cables, where does it go? Left, right? Left. To the left, all right? That's the, that's the bushing inside the transformer. And it's also H1A. Our outbound cable goes out as H1B. So inbound and outbound. That's the rules that we follow in normal operation out there. Does anybody remember by the fault indicator that was on the video where they had the fault indicator mounted at or which elbow they had it on? B. B, okay. So I'm just gonna draw my little box right here like they had and they mounted their fault indicator, draw a little wire down here and here's my little window out here. They had the fault indicator on B, if that's what the company asks you to do, then do that, okay? Here's the thing to look out for, and it doesn't happen in, in a lot of cases. It happens occasionally. So I'm gonna draw my outbound cable from here. I'm gonna draw a transformer right beside it. Where does my outbound cable come from this transformer into where? A. Right into A. And once again, outbound on B. All right, I'm going to install another indicator because that's the way my company wants to do it and have my little looking glass right down in here. This is the thing to realize and look out for. 
is H1B, where I have it mounted. Let's see if I can do a little bit different here. I can't. Where I have it mounted on H1B, what is the fault indicator? Let's put it out this way, looking at. What is it seeing? What part of the conductor? Going out. Uh, everything from here, follow my red line, to here, to here. Now, does it stop there? Does it go to the, to the next indicator? There you go. Thank you very much. It's looking at the transformer also, all the way to the top of the next indicator. Uh, the purpose of the fault indicator, indicator is for us to find faulted cable. All right. It is in some cases, and you'll typically find this out when you open the transformer up. If I were to open this transformer up on the right hand side and there was a fault internal to the transformer, typically it's going to show itself. You're going to have some leaking oil. You're going to have, uh, you know, maybe some smoke or fire damage around the elbows or whatnot, you're gonna see something. But in some cases, there are internal transformers, transformer faults that you cannot see. So if I've got my red indicator here and white indicator here, it is looking at the outbound cable, the inbound cable and the transformer. So I wanted to pass that on to you also. Now we'll go through the process. Well, how do I know if it's, if it's the transformer or not? We'll go through that process in just a moment. I just wanted to, in this part, portion right here, not only is it looking at the cable, it's looking at the next transformer upstream. This one right here. All right, so we're gonna use those two transformers. Let me uh, undo that. One transformer. And this, this bounces back to Professor B's video also. H1A, H1B. H1A, H1B. Now I'll go to red line. Well, I'll put my cable in. Cable in, cable out. Cable in, cable out. Fault indicator and fault indicator. And right, now I'll go to different colors. I'm monitoring this piece of cable to here, through the transformer to the next indicator right there. So I've come down here and I've had a red and I've had a white in indication right here. What did the video tell you to do to confirm that this cable was bad? Was there, a, did it say, oh, this has identified it and I'm good to go. Do you think we've just stopped there with the indicator? No. 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 What do I need to do to this span of conductor to confirm that it is the bad conductor? Test it. There you go, test it. Test it with the high pot sticks. All right, you're already going to have a voltage source over here. So, what's the rules? Isolate. Test, restore. Test. Now, this is a test confirmation that we're doing on fault indicators. So the first thing I have to do when I isolate is do what? I'm gonna start drawing some blue lines here. I've gotta take this one off, correct? I've gotta take this one off, put it on a feed through, then I've gotta test it. All right, so here's the ultimate comeback. I've got this one off the transformer. I test the cable and the cable tests good. What is the problem in this scenario? 
Transformer. The transformer is bad. All right, the cable is good, the transformer is bad. Let me swap that around. I test the span of conductor and I get 3.9 and it stays at 3.9. Bad cable. Bad cable, there you go, because I have it isolated off the transformer right here. All right, is there any questions there? The big thing to remember when you're doing drive by or walk by and you're using fault indicators is looking at the cable all the way up to the next indicator. Do not discount the transformer in the process. Anything you'd like to add there, Professor V? No, sir, that was great. All right. So, my previous drawing that you saw before, I mean, and I've seen it happened before and I'll draw this out just real quick with about three transformers or four. One, two, three. Let's put an open point right there. Four. And there's my new pole feeding right there. Uh, we'll give you a couple of different cases here. Fuse blown. White, 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 white. Where's my bad spam? From the fuse to the first one? The fuse to the first one, right? Remember, that's a good thing to remember. That's always your first indicator, okay? Let me erase some stuff here. Go back to my trusty little pencil. Where'd it go? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, fuse is blown. Red, white. Where's my bad spam? Between the red and the white. All right. You need to watch your, just like I said before, you need to watch your company's policy as far as the A and B. So it's between this transformer, T1 and T2. I pull off the B, the outbound cable of this one, and I pull off the A, inbound cable of this one is the cable now isolated. So I took the outbound off of here and I talked, took the inbound off of T2 is my cable now isolated. Yes. It is. And what do I need to do with the open point? Close it. Just close it. Yeah. Really, an open point would be all I have to do is take it off here, take it off the standoff, put it on the transformer, replace the fuse. Now, this one is energized because I've got the inbound still on, on T1. And I've got this one back fed. Like I said before, remember when we say back feed, we're feeding it backwards into this transformer, all power is restored. Okay. Any question about uh, fault indicators? Their purpose, how they're used. Um, remember there's multiple types out there and we'll touch on it here in just a moment. Uh, Robbie, have you seen any overhead indicators? Yes. Um, I had many of them in my area because I had a lot of rural territory to go through. And I just went through and strategically placed them on the three phase so I could know how far down to look for my fault. So, yeah, um, very, very good piece of equipment for overhead as well. Same, same things. Okay. So you see, I'm drawing another diagram out here. <clears throat> All right. And this is essentially what we're looking at out there at the field. Here's my breaker in a substation. It comes out overhead. Then I will change colors here. Then it goes underground all the way down that right away, right beside our field, goes to a manhole, then comes up and goes back out overhead right there. At the substation, they have three 
fault indicators on the overhead part. And out here, right here where it gets ready to take off and go overhead, they've got three fault indicators up here. Any indicate any kind of thoughts here of why they would put three and three like that just on the underground section? Say that one more time. I didn't hear. Why would I want to put three fold indicators at the beginning of my underground feeder dip, and then put three more where it takes off and goes overhead? Remember, this is a solid connection here. So there's no fuses on my red line anywhere all the way up to the breaker. My breaker is my only protection. I guess it's one, if one goes out, then you still got the other two. If a breaker goes out, it takes out all three phases. All right, on my overhead line. This is going out into the world out there. It can stretch for miles, correct? If I have a fault on my overhead line anywhere on the feeder portion of it, how do I, what should my fault indicators here read? Red. Red, correct, okay. Anywhere I fall to my overhead line, what should that indicator should read red? What should these three indicators over here read? What? Did they see a fault also? The fault's over here. Oh, red. Okay, yeah, they're gonna see red also. So you're gonna have red flashing lights, red flashing lights. This tells the lineman when he comes up to this one on the uh, right-hand side, the riser pole, the fault is out there on my overhead system and I need to patrol it and find it. So let's change a couple things around here. Let's erase. I've got a fault somewhere out there in my system. I drive to the uh, substation, I start patrolling out right here. I've got a red indication right here. Whoops. Why did that move? Why is everything moving? Oh, I know why. Picked the wrong one. Let me erase that. Draw with the squiggling line. I've got a red indication right here. This one is white. Where's my fault at? From the red to the white. Right somewhere in my underground feeder part. Remember, I can't see this, this is underground. So the breaker locks out due to some fault. Now the lineman knows or the crew supervisor knows right away. I've got a red indicator at the station. Well, my indicators up here at the riser pole at 501 are white. I've got bad underground. So they don't need to go any further as far as the process is concerned. They're great on that aspect. And the other aspect here is I'll just draw it in the same one is if you had, I think Professor V said it. Here, I'll just clear the screen. And go this. If I've got an underground feeder, let's say it goes for five miles like that, and I got another piece of the feeder that comes down here and goes another four miles, I think it would be a great opportunity to go ahead and put three indicators here and three indicators going this direction. I'm driving down here. The fault occurred here. These are going to be red. What are these going to be? White. No fault happened down there. So now I, I can keep patrolling in this direction until I find the fault. They're, I like to call it like a little sectionalizer. It's not a, the sectionalizer switch. <clears throat> sectionalize is what you need to patrol. So that's a good description of overhead fault indication. Okay, any questions there? Let me get a stop share here. Ravis, Rappi, are you referencing the quiz as we go through this? I, I'm looking at it. Okay, anything that I missed there? Um, the only thing that I see that's 
not been touched on yet is the primary bush and resignation. I mean, designations in a three phase transformer. Oh, okay. Yeah, we talked about that in the field. And I'll just put up here as a uh, quick note. Yeah. So we'll have it on video. Share screen, whiteboard, share. And let's go over here. All right, let's clear this. Okay, three phase transformer. Primary side is always on the left. Secondary side is always on the right. So you're gonna have bushings. Now I know in the transformers that we had on the field, we had what they call a Y insert. A lot of transformers now, those are older transformers. And now a lot of transformers come in this configuration. They got three bushings in and they got three bushings out. Now this is gonna be called H1A, H2A, H3A, and this is gonna be called H1B, H2B, H3B. And you can use fault indicators too if you wanted to on these, these conductors. All right, why did I put that? H that is all wrong. H2A. No, that's right. One. That's right. B, correct. H2B. H1B, 2B, 3B. Let me clear that up a little bit. Erase. And draw again. H2A. H2B, H3B. Remember to keep your phasing correct. When you have one that's got this multiple side transformer, now it doesn't, it, Robbie, as far as you were concerned with Duke Energy, yes. did it matter which one ABC was on as long as they matched? Um, no, not really. It was, as long as they matched up, it was good. Yeah, so, I mean, A phase is gonna go to A phase. Right. B phase is gonna go to B phase. And C phase is going to go to C phase, and you can see how I drew those letters in. If you went A, B, C, top to bottom, that would be fine also, but do keep them right. in order. Obviously, B cannot be on the bottom or the top. Right. All right. So you'll notice each one of these has the, uh, and I go by the by the ones in here as far as A to the inbounds one, inbound ones. Secondary side, they've got an X, O. X1, X2, X3, secondary bushings. XO is neutral and ground. All right. The X1 and X2 and X3 bushings directly correspond with the H bushings. Okay. And I, this is why I use the H1 side. H1. Let me get colors going on here, make it look nice and pretty. H1 corresponds with X1. H2 corresponds with X2. H3 corresponds with X3. So it's simplistic to go out there in the field. And if you're having voltage problems, if I measure from X3 to X1 and I get no voltage, which primary phase is out? H3. H3. X3 and H3 directly correspond. So if I'm not getting a voltage from X3 to neutral over here, the X3 primary phase is out. Okay, that's true for all three phase pad mount transformers. <clears throat> Single phase, gotta remember, it's just a plain, simple in, out. Okay, secondaries are, are just gonna correspond with voltage or no voltage. All right.
Did I catch it there, Professor D? You got it. All right, let's clear that then. And you wanted to start on the bond? Yep, that's the last part of the, for the quiz that we have not talked about. Excellent, excellent. Okay. So let me stop sharing here. I'll give you the helm, then uh, okay. we'll, do, we'll do the underground portion right there, break wherever you need to. Okay. And then we'll do a, a test or a quiz review. Right. Well, <clears throat> before we take a break, guys, we're gonna, we've looked at, um, you know, the three different ways that the steps that we go through, like Professor Shoemaker said a few minutes ago, when you're working a primary outage, identify, isolate, and then restore. But then you have to back up when you figure out you've got a, a piece of cable that you've isolated, piece of primary cable, uh, you're gonna have to go back and repair it now. Like we talked about with secondary and services, if it's in conduit, you wouldn't take the, um, the secondary locator and you wouldn't waste your time locating that cable, um, trying to figure out where the bad uh, place in the wire is uh, because it's, it's in conduit to start with and you're going to pull that out and replace that secondary cable. Well, it's the same thing with primary. If that um, underground primary is in a conduit, you're just going to pull that primary out. I don't, I don't know really uh, what Santee Cooper does as far as their construction, and but Duke has gone to a, a method of installing three single two-inch conduits to put their, um, if they're gonna put it in conduit, then they'll run each phase separately in a conduit. Is that the way Santee does? Yeah, we moved to that uh, many years ago. We used to put all three phases or even yeah. two phases in one conduit. Right. You got one failure, you, you need to pull everything out. So we moved to the individual conduit per phase. Sure, we did the same thing, makes it a whole lot easier, a whole lot less trouble to just replace one span of, a wire then to have to replace all three. So now we've determined that, you know, we do have a, a faulted span of cable. And as well, um, I'll, I'm not sure Santee's method, but at Duke for many years, they, they've got a system in place where they track the number of faults that are on a cable. So when you get to that third time that that underground cable has gone out, um, you don't go out and you might go out and repair it just for temporary, but at some point that cable is going to be replaced. Is that what Santee does as well? Or yeah, and you're talking you direct buried. You're talking direct buried. Every single yeah. time you had a fault in conduit, you replaced it. Right. Uh, we our, our maximum was three. Yeah, it didn't depend. It did not depend on the span length. Right. So once I went to the third splice. Yep. I had to replace that. Now, why do you think you got to replace after three splices? Any guesses on that? The cable gets weak. Even, even though the splice is intended to be a really, really good connection between your primary conductor, it does offer resistance. There, there's no, the conductor itself in perfect shape from end to end, is the best conductor that you have. Once you start adding more splices to it, you're gonna add resistance to that conductor and it's just not gonna be as effective. Right. Okay, guys, once we've determined that we do have, you know, a bad span of primary cable that is direct buried, there's a machine um, just like we had the machine, the um, Dynatail to locate the, the secondary faults. There, there is, there's a few machines out there, but the most widely mach uh, used machine I think that's out there is called the Von Arc Reflection System. Um, use, we, we just broke it down and called it a thumper for many years because it would, it does what it says, that, you know, what the name of what we called it, it thumps. You can hear a, um, and you can feel it when you put your hands on the ground when you're locating that cable, you can feel that thump and that lets you know where the, the, fault, it, the fault is in the cable. But I'm gonna I'm share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Yes, sir. All right, and just, just remember that name. That's, that's the piece of equipment that is gonna be used when trying to locate a faulted primary cable. Like 
collection system is an easy to use, easily transportable cable fault location device. It allows trained users to quickly isolate faulted primary underground cable. This video will highlight some basic operation features of the bond. If you have operation questions, once you're on a job site, please contact your bond representative. In the West region, contact James Lander at 352-408-9630. In the East Region, Canada and International Inquiries, contact Jerry Landers at 352-408-7890. If you can't reach your representative, a number for the Bond Corporation and brief operational instructions are listed on the inside lid of your system. One very important note, the Bond Corporation recommends that operators use all of the safety measures demonstrated in this video. However, nothing supersedes the safety regulations of your company. If there is a conflict, always follow the safety rules and regulations of your company. Just like we talked about this morning when the guy was showing the video this morning of the uh, fault indicators and what he, they said the same thing and you'll see this in all most safety videos um, or equipment that you're going to use it. They're going to tell you to always go back to your company's safety rules um, if there's any questions. That's the main thing. They they do have safety in mind when they're designing this equipment, but you always put your company safety rules ahead of what um, the safety you know is for this equipment. The Von Arc reflection system combines a user-friendly cable radar with a capacitive discharge unit in a compact, lightweight, portable package that's easily transported in virtually every truck van or SUV. Let's see how easy it is to use the bond system to locate a fault on an isolated cable section. But before we begin, here's two safety notes. If possible, all hookups should be performed using a hot stick and or properly rated rubber gloves, depending on your utilities requirements. We'll illustrate the hookup on a typical dead front pad mount transformer. Before you begin, remember the far end of the cable being tested must be parked and or open, not grounded. Begin by cleaning enough of the neutral bundle so two connections can be made. The green safety case ground Bond provides and the approved grounding jumper device that your company uses. Cleaning the connections is the most important step of the hookup process. Notice the lineman cleans the grounds and the concentric neutral of the cable under test. Ron recommends using a feed-through device so the parking bushing is removed and the feed-through installed. Make sure the cable that's not being tested has a bushing cap or cover to avoid inserting the high-voltage lead into the wrong bushing. You can see here how close the feed-through is to the transformer bushing. That's why it's critical that any open bushing be covered with an approved bushing cover as illustrated here. Using a hot stick, the elbow is inserted into the feed-through and a grounding elbow is installed into the open bushing. Some utility. So why do you think they take that um, feed-through, put the feed-through on there and then put that grounding bushing on? What was the purpose of that, guys? So they can test? They, do, they want to make sure that they've got the right cable, that it's not energized. What we did, even before we put the ground on there, we, we always put the tick tracer on the test point. And normally the, the test point's going to be, we showed us the little flat piece on our elbows that would be right in this section. And you want to test for absence of voltage. And that ground, if there's anything that uh, capacitance that might be built up or anything built up in that cable, you're going to discharge it when you put that um, grounding cable on there. Yeah, re remember that the, the day before, or maybe even hours before, the person, the two-man crew that came out there and tested that cable, they put 3,900 volts of DC on it. Right. Do you, do you want to be messing with that? Negative. No. They should have grounded it, but you got to ground it too. Correct. These tests from the parking bushing by removing the access port cap. Then, using an approved voltage meter or detection device, 
Test the other side of the feed-through or test port to ensure the cable is de-energized. After you complete the testing, be sure to insert a grounding elbow in the feed-through. You're now ready to hook up the leads from the barn. One quick note, be sure the green safety case ground is uncoiled fully before beginning the hookup. All right, guys, one, one very important step there, what he just mentioned about that green case ground. You want to make sure it's uncoiled completely. And we like to kind of take the bar and set it off to the side um, of our transformer. That way, we didn't really have to worry about stepping over these cables, walking over them. We could really uncoil everything, um, just like what they're talking about here, and kind of kind of have it to the side of the, um, of the transformer where we, where we wouldn't have to be all over it. Uh, electrically, electrically, uh, just in case something does happen in this process, why do we uncoil the ground wire? Electrical property. What happens when I coil up a piece of wire? Yeah, magnetic field. Mm -hmm. This is back from the old days. If I take a piece of wire, does it make a larger magnetic field and intensify amperage? Yes. Okay, yes. yeah. All right, so if I do have a problem, I want that ground wire uncoiled. Kind of a little bit sketchy in my head here. We'll just, you can leave it where it's at, Professor V. Yeah. Riddle me this one. He took the elbow off. He grounded it. Then he tested it. Then he regrounded it. Yeah. Is, that, is that what I got out of that? That's what it looked like, yeah. All right, guys, what are you supposed to do before you do the first grounding? Yes. Test first. I don't, uh, I think they kind of did that by accident there. And I've seen this video a hundred times. Yeah. I think he grounded it and then they thought, oh, you know, we didn't test it first. Yeah. So test it before you ground it. Just don't go grounding cable that you're not sure is there any voltage or not. I can tell by the elbow size here, this is 34 kV. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty high voltage. You want to test before you ground. I'm done, Professor V. Okay, just remember to uncoil that green cable completely before you start your machine. Begin by attaching the green safety case ground. Then connect the high voltage return to the concentric neutral on the cable being tested as close as possible to the cable termination point. Next, remove the grounded elbow. And finally, insert the brass elbow probe attached to the high voltage lead. Okay, you can pause it right here. Okay. All right, guys, so uh, we didn't see, we'll see here in just a moment as far as the machine is concerned. Some of these machines will put up a DC voltage of right around 90 kV. Right. That's 90,000 volts DC. When you're in the testing process, and uh, you'll see as soon as he takes his shotgun off, that's an exposed brass piece of metal right there. So don't be hovering around the transformer, trip or fall, or accidentally have your pants or something make contact with that brass right there. It's gonna be at a very, very high voltage. Yeah. And, and what we did here was a little bit different. We had the same end as that, not, not the probe that the, he just stuck in that test point in that elbow or the uh, feed through, but we actually had another clamp just like this one. And we actually had to take the elbow off, the pin out, the elbow off, and we directly connected onto the, um, the, the connector on the end of the cable instead of doing this huh. method. Huh. And then at that point, instead of leaving it like that, we were required to wrap all that up in a, um, a rubber blanket. Right. We're now ready to find the fault. The operation of the Von Arc reflective system, regardless of right your there? model type, is essentially the same. You pause it right there? Yep, but All right, guys, just, yeah, I, I know this piece of equipment looks difficult, but it's really not that hard to use at all. Read. Everything that you need to know is in the lid. Right. Red, red means what? Oh, bad. You know, bad. You know, don't do these things, all right? Red means bad. Green means what? 
Good, good. good. Those are good things to do here, okay? <laughs> Those are the right things to do. Uh, and we'll get into it when it gets more into the machine. You pretty much cannot tear up the machine by doing flipping any switches or knobs or anything like that. Now, you might be hurting somebody else down the line. There's only one thing that you can do on this the machine that'll tear it up. And you, uh, we'll show you here in just a moment. Go ahead. Okay. My step hookup and operating instructions are located on the inside lid of the Vaughn Reflective System for easy reference, including the phone number for the Vaughn Corporation. To begin, set the voltage indicator with the white mark up, then switch to the lowest voltage. So you want to adjust your your voltage, your, your output voltage, and that's going to be DC volts. You want to set it. We always set ours to zero to start and on the lowest setting, just like what they talked about. Is that what you all did, Professor? We did just how he's got in the picture. We went mid-range. Now, yeah. depending on the on the cable that we're testing. Yeah. I uh, Just leave it on this picture right here. Yeah. The conductor that we have for underground primary is 15 kV conductor, and we're using that for 7,200 volt installations. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. I'm insulated to 15 kV, but the voltage that I'm running through it is 7,200. So in this case right here, I'd probably go mid-range uh, on, the, on the knob there in 15 kV mode. Why would I use 15 kV mode? What's my conductor? What's my conductor rating? I just told you. 15. 15 kV. Okay, so if I go half mid-range with my knob of mid-max down there, I'm going to be below the specified value of, of the cable itself. I mean, remember here, we're not just trying to almost find a fault. We're trying to find a fault. Okay, and sometimes you have to put some voltage on that cable to make, to make make that happen. Now we never, if you've got 15 kV cable, we never ran it over 10 kV, All right? So you don't wanna overrate your cable, but that is how you do make the adjustment. All right, and this is the part I wanted to get to. You see that little red, and I know you can't read the lettering in it, the little red stamp they got in there right beside the meter? Yeah. All right, you see that? Do not adjust the voltage while the unit is turned on. All right, that'll destroy the unit. If you adjust voltage while the unit is turned on, it messes up the capacitor inside the unit and you're pretty much buying a new unit. The last one I bought for the Myrtle Beach Service Center, and this is probably years ago, was around $32,000. These things aren't cheap. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if you turn it on and your voltage is not right, turn it off, adjust the knob. Turn right. it back on, it's not right, turn it off, adjust the knob. Do not adjust the knob while the unit is turned on. Go ahead, Professor B. Here we go. Check the battery to make sure it's fully charged. Place the machine in radar mode and turn the unit on. The bond will then automatically find and mark the open. Next, push the green start button. The unit will charge to the level you've set on the indicator. It will then discharge and the fault will automatically be marked. The distance to the fault from your test point is located in the lower left position of the screen. In this case, the fault is 394 feet from the test point. Can you pause it there? Now we're set. And we're going to draw this out a little bit. And you see how fast this, this happens. All right, for one thing here, there's two modes that are going on. You got a radar mode and you got a thump mode that he showed down there at the bottom. You'll notice on the, uh, right, maybe. You wanna show the thump mode? Yeah, you say right there where his hand's at. Right here. Yeah, thump mode and radar mode. The first mode you're going to use is radar, all right? Radar sends out a frequency signal, not a voltage signal down the conductor. Okay, let it play until it gets to the screen. Is that it? Uh, there's a clearer one. It will automatically be marked. The distance to the wall. Pause ball. that. All right, it's kind of hard to see here and I'm gonna draw them out when we get done with this video on a screen. The top 
line that you see, it'll show the beginning of the cable. Yeah. On the left hand side, and it'll show the end of the cable. So that squiggling line, that's the beginning. Go all the way down, keep going down. No, yeah. no. And that's the end of the cable. And you can move hash marks inside, and it's going to tell you 450 feet. All right. As soon as you press start, it sent an, a radar signal down, and you'll notice the beginning of the cable. Go ahead and put your mouse over the beginning. Down on the next the next one down. Right. right. And then he goes out. Then you see that downward spike right at the beginning of the downward spike. That's your fault in fault indication. This is through radar only. And then where he's got his finger at is going to show you the approximate. Now, guys, remember this, please. Approximate amount of feet distance to the fault location. Yep. Okay, go ahead. From your test point is located in the lower left position of the screen. In this case, the fault is 394 feet from the test point. Now a second worker can travel the cable path the approximate distance indicated by the Vaughn trays. The unit operator then presses the stop button and switches from radar to thump and presses the start button. The unit will then begin an auto thump sequence every 11 to 14 seconds. It, it's real fast there. And I know you yeah. could probably pump your volume up. As soon as he got done saying seconds in the ground, there was a little explosion. Oh. It went thunk in the ground. You can actually feel it in your feet. Yeah. So what the thumper is doing every 11 to 14 seconds is sending a high voltage charge down the cable to wherever you had it set at. And it's arcing in the ground and you're finding the explosion that's happening. Go ahead, Professor V. And you, and you pretty much have to know when you get into like a subdivision and you're having to locate and you're having to use a map to find, you know, transformer to transformer. I mean, just like this guy wheeled off the footage. Um, sometimes you really may not know which way that cable's going and, and it's going to be a crapshoot out there. And, and you're going to have to just walk until you hear that thump. I mean, we've done that many times. I mean, we've actually had a, a set of earphones attached to a cable that was kind of like a thesoscope and it had a big metal round disc that we would put on the ground and we'd just move it kind of like we did with the um, with the wand when we were locating an underground fault. You know, we'd do it 20, 30 feet at a time until we could start picking up that thumping noise. We have about, we have between 20 and 25 listening devices per fleet. Yeah. You know, we used. Right. Right. You walk that, grab a traffic cone. Yeah. Big, big one, if you got the chance. Put that traffic cone on the ground, put your ear to it. It's like a megaphone. Pick it right up. Right. To 14 seconds. Features of the Vaughn arc reflection system can be adjusted to fit your utility's needs. You can change the range of the radar trace from 500 feet to a maximum of 48,000 feet. Some models have a maximum range of 24,000 feet. The velocity of propagation is based on a percentage of the speed of light and is set at the factory at 53.0% for extruded cable. If you're testing paper and lead cable, you can adjust the velocity from 38.0 to 48.0%. You can also manipulate the left and right markers. Simply push the key next to the one you want, and then use the arrow keys to move it in the direction you desire. For example, after testing for a fault, if the fault is not automatically marked by the right marker, press the trace button and move it up to the upper trace line. Then press the right marker, and using the arrow keys, move the right marker to the left, just in front of the downward spike. That will give the distance to the fault from the test point. The bond also comes with three adapters for the high voltage lead. You want to pause it? No. You, okay, here we go. The brass elbow probe is for dead front equipment. Next is a hotline clamp, which can be used at that's, a riser pole or that's what we use. Damage. Both of these attachments are preferred. However, 
a third vice grip attachment is included if the brass elbow probe or hotline clamp cannot be used. When not in use, the bronze should be plugged in to keep the battery fully charged. But if the battery is discharged, the power cord can be plugged into any 120 volt source, including an inverter or generator. And the bond will operate and charge simultaneously. There's also a 12 volt DC connection and cable that allows you to use a 12 volt DC source. Remember, after completing any test using the bond arc reflection system, Press the red stop button, verify the voltmeter reads zero, and the stop gap is closed. And that's important, guys, right there, because just like what we talked about when they put the ground on the cable itself, this, this is what it does here. When that is putting that pulse down that cable, and I mean, it, it's, it's still there until you know that it's gone to ground when these contacts have made contact with each other and it's gone to ground there. You, you just don't want to go start snatching off these leads off this cable. Um, a buddy of mine did that one time and it, you know, and it, it gave him a pretty good jolt, kind of like what, a little bit harder probably than what Keaton saw when he grabbed that, um, the um, Dynatel in the other day. So, um, <laughs> which that was good. I mean, sorry, Keaton. <laughs> anyway, you want to make sure that this, this sequence stop Make sure it's at zero and these contacts have closed. And you can hear that in the machine. It makes a little thump noise itself to let you know, hey, the contacts have closed and it's made contact. Yeah, I mean, they, they claim, and they've got the window for it, they claim that once you hit the stop button, it grounds the cable for you. Uh, and I'm sure Professor V had to do this too. Even, even at that, when you pull off the equipment that you're using at that brass insert or whatever, you have to reground the cable like you did exactly. before. Right, right. And, I, and I'll give you guys an experience that I had um, many years ago and it was a older Vaughn Thumper we had. It wasn't anything like that one. It was a big square box. And you could on those box, what we did, we could adjust the, um, the output with it turned on and we usually went from 15,000 to 25 to 30,000 DC volts with us putting out. We were thumping, we were thumping cable at an industry over in Sumter. And I just started, I didn't know what the machine was and, and the guys thought it was pretty funny. I didn't at the time, but anyways, they told me to get on my hands and knees to try to feel that thump and they showed me where it might want to be, might would be. So I, I got on my hands and knees. And just at the time that I, I put my hands on the ground where they thought it was, somebody turned the machine on and it thumped. And it went through my body, through my arms and in through my chest. And it just feels like somebody just took a baseball bat and just beat me in my chest. I mean, so really it's nothing to play with. They thought it was funny at the time, but it, I was sore for about two or three days where um, it went through my body. I mean, yeah. which it can be a dangerous piece of equipment. So yeah, that, that's a little bit too much horsing around there. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, um, don't, don't play with this equipment. Let's finish it out. And when disconnecting the unit leads from the transformer, be sure to discharge the voltage by firmly touching the lead probe on the system neutral lead bond to drain off any capacitance remaining on the unit. Always follow the safety rules and regulations of your utility. Given its many features, durability, portability, and ease of use, it's easy to see why the Vaughn Arc Reflection System is fast becoming the preferred method for cable fault locating and loop sectionalizing. Call us. We'll be happy to give you a complete demonstration. Now, good piece of equipment for finding those faults. So we've located the fault guys. Before we put a shovel in the ground, what, what are we supposed to do next before we dig that up? It's the law. Yes. No case. Huh? Get your look. Who do you call? 811. 811. Make sure you dial up 811 and get call. That, in that case, it's probably going to be an emergency locate and they'll they'll be out within, you know, a couple hours or so to locate um, anything around that cable for you. And they will locate the primary as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
So good piece of equipment. You guys got any questions about any of that? About the um, Vaughn Thumper there? Or yeah, Vaughn Art Reflection System? Just, just a comment here. You know, you can start uh, after you get your locator, the immersive locate. You can yeah. start digging down there. And remember, guys, you're digging in a hole, probably a backhoe and shovels, and you're looking for a cable that's this big around. Mm -hmm. right? And that might be a little bit tough to do. It's okay to dig for a while. And then if uh, you haven't found the cable yet, go ahead and rethump. Get, right. right? yeah. get out of the hole. Get out of the hole and you can rethump and you can get more precision and closer to it as you uh, thump down that cable. Uh, you want to take a little break here? Oh, what time we got? Yeah, 1034. Let's take about uh, 1045. Sounds good. See you guys at 1045. He comes to save the day. All right. 1045. Got a share going on there, Hey. You got a share going on? All right, we're recording. We're back at it, gentlemen. Just real quick here on this um, Vaughn machine. I'm going to draw better what they had on the radar right there. So what they had there on that top trace is once you've got it connected and you're just letting it sit there, it will give you in radar mode, the beginning of the cable, and what you see in the squiggly, a lot of squiggly lines right here, that's the connection point. So that's all the cable you have laid out in the ground. And it'll automatically put you a mark here, and right at the beginning here. And it'll show you down here, we'll just use an arbitrary number, 395 feet. So that's in the first trace mode. And that's your cable span that's going through here. As soon as you hit thump in radar mode, we're not in thump thump mode with voltage. You're going to get another trace down here at the bottom. It's going to come out here like that, then go down here like that. The hash marks are all automatically going to change for you. You're going to get one at the beginning of the cable and you're going to get one Right here at the beginning, this is your fault location on radar. All right, then your footage, get my eraser right here. Then your footage is going to change. And it's going to tell you, let's see, we went about half the distance. We had 340. So we're going to go, uh, it's going to say 176 feet. That's the process of when you started uh, wheeling off and that guy started wheeling off to go to the thumb, to start looking at the thumb. Okay. Just a real quickie here. I mean, it just shows you what you're looking for you on, the, uh, on the screen itself. It's really a technological piece of equipment, but easy to use. All right. What you've got to also take into account here, 176 feet, it's counting from the transformer down into the ground. Your ground's not always going to be even. You know the bottom of your trench until the fault point. So don't think this is an exact number, that 176. I've got to go a certain amount of feet down that I'm, you know, my ditch is not 100% straight. It's going to put you in the general location. Hold on. Sorry about that interruption. Okay. Now, I'm gonna ask some questions out there. And this is about when we're using the phasing sticks before and with the high pot adapter. It starts at 3.9, stays at 3.9. What is that? Oh, the bolted. Bolted fault, right. Okay, 
the ground is actually touching the core conductor. 3.9 goes down to, eh, we'll say 1.6, goes back up to 3.9. What is that? Puncture fault. Puncture fault. I've actually got to build up a charge before it goes across that puncture and makes contact to ground. All right, 3.9, zero. What is that? Good. Good, and I hope you got this in your notes. Goods or what? Open point. Good or open, thank you. Now this is rare, and I'm gonna draw a piece of conductor cable right down here, primary conductor. So there's my primary conductor and here's the conductor that's inside that's hot. Sometimes you'll have a primary conductor and all of this is in dry sand and all of this is burnt away and you see how far back in here my conductor has burnt down. Let me get the color. So this is uh, my primary conductor. When I put the phasing, uh, the high pot adapters on this and I test this, the voltage is not enough for this to go across the insulation and make contact with ground, all right? Even though the cable is cut in two, that's considered an open. So we really don't know if we've got the end of the cable or not, do we, by radar. So that's an open. Rare, but it does happen. So how can we determine if it's an open or good cable? Now this is direct buried now, it's got nothing to do in conduit. If it's in conduit, you just pull out the old, put in the new, that's obvious. All right, let's go new here. Go black. Here's my trace on radar. Remember, we expect, we expect this to be the end of cable. That's what it normally is. Can it also be an open? Yeah. Yeah. We're not 100% sure. And I, I, you know, could probably help us out on this pro uh, problem that's going on here. I hook my radar up and it's showing me 10 feet, obviously. It goes further than 10 feet. My next transformer is 100 feet down. That's an open. How do I test? All right, and there's the beginning of the cable. There is a method that I can actually use on the conductor to make sure this is the end of the cable. Now, let me go back for just a moment. I'll use the top trace. All right, I just drew in a fault right there. Okay, so that's a phase to ground fault. What happened as far as the waveform right here? Do I have a spike or do I have a dip? dip. It dipped down. As soon as I had it radar mode, and I press the thump button to test it, it sent down a radar signal and it put a dip in my, uh... oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Control Z, there you go. It put a dip in my waveform. How can I go out here on my bottom trace? Uh, let's draw and make sure or test, test this conductor 
to make sure that this is the actual end of conductor. What can I do to it at the end? What does a fault do down here? It makes the cable, it makes the trace do what? Dip. Dip. What can I do to this end to make it dip? Remember the top one, phase to ground fault, dip. So what can I do to make this one? Go from phase dip. to ground. Huh? From phase to ground. There you go, ground it. Okay, you're at the machine end. I tell Tariq to, hey, run down to the other end and ground the conductor at your far end. What should the waveform do? Dip. Dip. Okay, all right, take it back off. It goes back to black. Ground it again, it dips. Okay, that's okay to do in radar mode. All right, you do that down at the end and nothing happens. What have you got here? Whoa. No, nothing happens. That's good. No. Then it's an open. Make sense? If I cannot make this divert by grounding it, we suspect this is the cable end and we ground it goes down. That's perfect, we found the cable end. If I ground it and nothing happens here, it's an open because it can't make it all the way to the end, all right? So how do you test the end of the cable to make sure it's your cable end? Ground it. in radar mode. Okay, Professor V, let me stop yeah. that share. Ready for a little review? I think we are. You want to do that or? Got it. Because I don't have it up right now. I've got it. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to go through some questions here. And this is going to go from um, using the Dynatel, phasing sticks, lawn art reflection systems, all that kind of stuff we've been going through for the past week and a half. Well, it's been about a week now, so um, I'm not going to give you any of the answers, but listen to the questions carefully. First of all, what equipment is used to locate underground secondary cable? Okay, and I just listed everything we talked about. It's one of those options. Uh, yeah, and before you get into this further, guys, read the question very carefully. Right. on these and I'll, I'll bring them up, up as they go here. You got to watch the wording, secondary, primary, locate the bad span or locate a thump is specific to certain types of equipment. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I'll repeat number one again. What equipment is used to locate underground secondary cable? We worked on that last week. Okay. So my left. All right. Question two, which one of the listed methods below is not used to introduce a signal onto a secondary cable using a Dynatel? I'll read it again. Which one of the listed methods below is not used to introduce a signal onto a secondary? Like Professor Schumacher said, be careful of the wording on these questions and wh it, whether they're referring to secondary or prim primary and it's secondary cable using the Dynatel, okay? And it's not to use, all right? Which frequency is used with the locating wand when not using the transmitter? Remember, we, we looked at that on the video. When locating cable, the ground rod, and this is on secondary, the ground, the ground rod probe is placed 90 degrees out from the suspected cable path. That's a true or false. That's during locating cable. All right, locating a secondary fault, what additional item is used when you're locating a secondary fault? Uh, number six, where does the ground probe go when locating faults, and that's secondary as well. All right, number seven, 
what is the best frequency selection to use when locating cable with the transmitter and wand or electric cable? We touched on that as well with the um, Dynatel. Next question, name two methods to determine a faulted span of primary cable. We talked about that yesterday and today. What two methods to determine a faulted span of primary cable, not secondary, primary cable. Number nine, what trips a fault indicator? Now, hold on there. Be Go careful ahead. on that one. It's, it's a multiple choice one. Right. Yeah. It is it what effect trips a fault indicator? Right. It makes a trip. Okay. Okay. Next question. When using fault indicators, how do you determine which span of primary is faulted? Okay. When using fault indicators, how do you determine which span of primary is faulted? All right. Using high pot adapter, which fault condition exists if the test reading of primary starts at 3.5 and stays at 3.5? Y'all better get that one. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you just went over it. Using the high pot adapter, what fault condition exists if stick test reading of primary starts at 3.5, goes to zero, stays at zero. Using the high pot adapter again, the fault condition exists if the stick reading of primary starts at 3.5, lowers to 1.1, goes back to 3.5. Guys, that's fresh in your mind. You get all three of them right. After testing a span of primary cable for five minutes, you should bleed off the voltage cable for how many minutes? And I don't remember if we went through that or not, Professor Shoemaker. Uh, we didn't. We didn't cover that. No. When he, and we can go through it right here. And uh, this is really specific to your company right here. Uh, our requirement was three times the amount of times that you, uh, you tested it. Okay, uh, what was Duke Energy? Same thing. All right, so if I'm testing a piece of cable or using the thumper on it, and I've got primary voltage on it, and I've got it on there for five minutes, how long do I have to keep it grounded? 15, 15. three times five is 15, there you go. All right, okay. go ahead. All right, next question. What piece of equipment is used to locate primary faults in the ground, not secondary, but primary faults in the ground. In the ground. We're not looking for the span that it's in. We're looking for where is it in the dirt? So what piece of equipment is used there? Okay. okay. True faults. The modes for primary locating machine are radar and thumb. Okay. That's that's easy. What must be done, the next question, with ground wire from the primary fault locating machine when testing? We looked at, that was the first thing we, one of the first things we stopped in the video to look at is um, when he hooked up that ground wire on the machine. I mean, from the machine to the um, cable being tested. What type of connection must be used when locating primary and secondary faults. What must you do? What kind of connection do you have to have? In South Carolina, you must call 811 before any dig is done, true or false. Next question. What is the primary standoff bushing used for? Do we have a... Go ahead. Yeah, you're good, go ahead. Okay. Next question. What is the primary feed through bushing used for? Guys, you can get this stuff, simple answers. Next question, true or false. 
in a single phase pad mount transformer, the H1B is for the incoming primary, true or false. So H1A is left, H1B is right. So Which go on that. When locating secondary faults, the A frame should always lead with which color or it will not locate the fault correctly. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Next question. <clears throat> In a three phase transformer, which primary bushing is directly related to secondary bushings X1, X2, X3? And guys, remember that's what Professor Shoemaker um, drew on the whiteboard before we had our first break. That was first break, right? Yeah. I think so. All right, last question. In a three phase enclosure, the inbound primary cable is located on the first position, left to right in each module, true or false. Okay. That's all the questions, guys. You got any questions? Questions on the questions? Questions on the questions on the questions. All right, hold on one second while we are here. I have received, and you can look at this in yours, Professor V, two, two of the 14 underground equipment presentations. Those are due by eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Yep. Okay, and the drop box is open for those in ELW 211. Um, it's drop box. I've got zero. Oh my goodness. You guys better get on the stick. Yeah, get on it, get to it, ride it, my pony. That's it. All right. Uh, any other comments, questions? How many slides are supposed to be on the presentation? Enough to cover all the equipment that's out there at the field. <laughs> I think it's like nine, bro. I'm pretty sure. If you, you remember, we did a dip pole riser pole. If you use two separate slides there, that's going to add a slide. If you put them both together, that's going to take away a slide. Does anybody need clarification on the presentation? And I'll just say this out loud. Dip pole, riser pole, switch gear, three phase enclosure, three phase transformer, single phase enclosure, single phase pad mount transformer, secondary enclosure. Do you accept secondary pedestal for secondary enclosure? Absolutely, yep, different, internet's got different names for them. Exactly. Okay, anything else? Professor V, I'm good if you're good. Yep. Mr. Cam, if you would, when, before we get off here, would, would you hang around for a few minutes, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you, buddy. And is anybody, uh, if anybody wants to hang around, has got any questions outside of today? As far as I'm concerned, and Professor B, today's lecture is over. Over. <laughs>